we're going to get started with introductions. And um, as it says on the welcome slide, if you have any issues throughout this process, please let me know, um, either via email or through the chat. So just a little welcome and some housekeeping up front. This is part two of Relink.org's webinar series addressing opioid addiction as a faith community. My name is Bethany Friedrichsen. I'm the statewide coordinator for Relink.org. Relink.org is a faith-based nonprofit statewide organization based out of Northeast Ohio. We started in 2017 with a desire to use technology to connect those in need due to addiction to the resources in their local community. Over the past three years, we have worked to develop a statewide online resource that allows those searching incident access to 64 different service categories and over 7,000 organizations across the continuum of care. This tool also serves the in need, um, those in need in the reentry and human trafficking community. And um, beyond our search tool, Relink.org makes an effort to constantly be involved in the community through outreach and educational opportunities such as today. So um, I will be helping facilitate the webinar today. If anyone has any issues, like I said, email me or message through the chat. Just a couple items uh, before we get started. We're excited to have over 200 registrants for today's webinar, representing over 45 of Ohio's 88 counties and um, a diverse set of backgrounds from CEOs to ministry leaders, nurses, and pastors. With so many joining us, we want to make sure that we use everyone's time wisely. When you join the webinar, you are muted. If you would like to ask a question, please type it in the chat box. I will be monitoring this during the different presentations and um, I will either ask them at the end or if it's appropriate, I'll ask throughout. Um, with so many on this call, we may not be able to get to everyone's questions before the hour is up. However, um, our presenters will stay on a little bit after for those who want to stay and um, get some other questions answered. We'll also collect any additional questions that we don't get to and send responses to those in the follow-up. This webinar is set to be an hour long. Please stick around to the end because we will have some important announcements of how to access follow-up materials and some next steps. If you must jump off early, that's okay. You will receive a follow-up email later this week with all the information. You'll also receive confirmation that you attended the webinar um, in case you need it for any work purposes. And um, we'll uh, connect you to anything mentioned in the webinar, links, videos, things like that, so you have it afterwards. So without um, further ado, I'm going to pass uh, the torch over to our executive director, Barbara Campbell, who is going to introduce today's webinar and speakers. So Barbara. Thank you, Bethany, and welcome to everyone. We really appreciate you joining us today for this really important uh, discussion. Um, I am the executive director of the Dalton Foundation, and we are very privileged to have been able to start um, reading.org back in 2017, as Bethany mentioned, and we still continue to support it because we believe passionately in the work uh, and, the, and the tool in connecting people to the resources they need. Um, today's webinar is entitled Understanding Harm Reduction, Stigma, and the Role of the Church. The goal of today's webinar is to cover the basics of harm reduction and the impacts that stigma can have. There will also be a Narcan training and information on how to access the life education in your own community. Um, this topic I know is one that has got a lot of, a lot of um, information. I personally myself have been um, different viewpoints on this altogether. And so I am really excited about having this discussion today um, and hearing from both Ashley and Greg, and I hope you are as well. Um, as I mentioned, today's speakers are going to be Ashley Rosser and Pastor Greg Delaney. Ashley is the Harm Reduction Specialist for Five Peer Support and the Cuyahoga County Representative for Harm Reduction Ohio. She has lived experience of drug use and homelessness and is now in recovery herself. 
Today, Ashley get it, dedicates her time to organizing outreach efforts, distribute Narcan, and visits the homeless communities in Cleveland and Akron. She supplies those in need with clothing, food, water, and supplies necessary to help them get by. Often the drug using community and homeless uh, community intersect and Ashley advocates to bring awareness to this cause. Uh, Greg Delaney serves as the hope director for Reach for Tomorrow Ohio, which is a nonprofit community organized and located in Highland uh, County, Ohio, where he leads a coordinated effort to educate churches and faith and community leaders about addiction, trauma, and human trafficking. Greg is also part of the Ohio, of Ohio Governor Michael Warren's Recovery Ohio Advisory Council, championing, championing the efforts of the recovery community in Ohio. Greg serves as the current outreach coordinator for a statewide alcohol and treatment center, Woodhaven, and is a contributor to the faith-based recovery efforts of the Health and Human Services Center for Faith and Opportunity Initiatives in Washington, D.C. In this role, he leads efforts to educate communities on the benefits of faith-based engagement in recovery um, in the United States. Greg serves on the board of Ohio Citizens for Advocacy, Addiction Recovery, and he is a person in long-term recovery himself. Greg is a graduate of Wright State University and has been married to his wonderful wife, Beth Delaney, for 30 years. It has been our privilege, I know, to speak for Beth and myself to get to know Ashley and Greg for the years and the, the passion that they bring to their work in this topic. And we are really thankful for their time and their participation in today's webinar. So, Ashley, I'm going to turn it over to you. Alrighty, so I'm going to turn this over to Ashley really quickly. Thank you so much. That was such a great introduction. I really appreciate that. Can everybody hear me okay? I just yeah. want to make sure. Okay. Yep, just one moment while I make you the host. There we go. Alrighty, I'm going to stop my share. You should be able to share your presentation now. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so like uh, Barbara and Bethany were saying, um, I have a lived experience in drug use and homelessness and I use my experience now that I'm in recovery to advocate for people that are still experiencing homelessness and that are still using drugs. Let's see. Um, there will be, like Bethany said, open discussion at the end for in time for questions. So harm reduction, it's, um, it's an approach to dealing with people who use drugs. Instead of asking them to be abstinent, we ask them to maybe minimize the harm that they're doing and ask them to um, consider taking care of their bodies because you know um, drug use comes with a lot of health issues physically and mentally. So the basic definition of harm reduction, <clears throat> the technical definition, um, harm reduction is a set of practical strategies and ideas aimed at reducing negative consequences associated with drug use. Harm reduction is also a movement for social justice built on a belief in and respect for the rights of people who use drugs. Um, because often people who are homeless and who are using drugs don't, don't get that voice and they don't get to speak for themselves. Um, so that's why I kind of took it upon myself to advocate for them, to give them their power back. That's what harm reduction does. It gives them a little bit of power and control over what happens to their bodies. Um, these three top, these three um, pinpoints I have here are three of the principles of harm reduction. So it meets people where they're at instead of expecting them to be abstinent, like I said. <clears throat> Does not put conditions on a person receiving access to care, respect, and love. Um, meeting people where they're at 
uh, and genuinely caring about them getting better means that we're not coercing them or putting any stipulations on how we treat them. So if, so if we know someone is using drugs, we may think that we know what's best for them, but that's not always the case. We have to empower them with words, how we talk to them, um, educate them, let them know how they can take care of their bodies. And we let them choose. We let them come to us and let us know when they're ready. Um, also, harm reduction is evidence-based and to be shown to be effective in decreasing substance-related harms. So if you, uh, we'll go over this later, but if you look at the patterns in the history about harm reduction, it's always backed by um, physicians, doctors, people who do the research, and that's how harm reduction workers and advocates get their information. And pinpoint three says, recognizes intersectionality as a reality for many people that use drugs they may be facing more than just one form of oppression and drug use is not the root but a symptom uh, this means that people can be a part of multiple different communities people that use drugs may not just be drug users but they also may be a person of color they may be um, lgbtq there are many different communities of people that are heavily stigmatized. So when we think about people that are using drugs, we have to consider all of the all of the sources for their trauma that they that they may be facing, and we have to we have to educate people on that reality. So it's like we can fix their drug use, but they're still being oppressed and traumatized from other parts of society. And it's, it's not helpful if we're only focusing on the substance use because that is just a symptom. It's not the root of their trauma. Okay, how did harm reduction come to be? This was so exciting to learn about and I'm so excited to share this. I learned a lot in my research about harm reduction and I'm so glad to share it. Um, harm reduction began in the 80s. Um, like I said on the last slide, uh, harm reduction advocates get their information from doctors, physicians, and that's how harm reduction started in the 80s when scientists discovered that the main focus or the main form of transmission of HIV and AIDS was through injection drug use, right? Um, although there were programs to educate the community, the cases still rose due to drug users not wanting to give up. And a part of uh, the harm reduction approach is coming to terms and realizing that substance use, people using substances will always be, we cannot put an end to it. It's always gonna, people are always gonna use some kind of substance no matter what we say. Um, it's, it's just something that's not gonna go away. So we have to adapt and change our thinking to say, to say um, okay, so if people are gonna continue to use substances, how can we minimize the risk? What can we do to be helpful instead of expecting people to stop using altogether? Um, you know, uh, we, in our society, we jail people, we put them in um, programs, which can help a lot of people. These are uh, court programs that people go through. A lot of people do find recovery, but there's also a huge portion of people that that doesn't work for and they're always going to be using substances so what we can do is meet them where they are like I said in the last slide and say okay well if you're going to um, use in, in, uh, injection drugs at least use sterile equipment like sterile syringes and that's what they did in the 80s when the HIV an AIDS epidemic happened. Scientists said, hey, this is, ha this is happening. This is the stats. This is what's going on. And the harm reduction advocates, the people that own the syringe exchanges, they are the ones that put it into action and took the data collected by the scientists to make a change and to affect these numbers to stop the spread of HIV and AIDS. And it actually, if you look at, if you look at the history, it actually did work. It made a dent. 
syringe exchanges grew in the 80s, even though there was a lot of stigma there also, it, it, it was still a huge help. There's a lot of different things going on and um, that wouldn't have happened without the harm reduction advocates to take that data collected by the scientists and put that out in the community and be advocates for education, sterile supplies, um, spreading awareness to other people to let them know that they were there. Okay, and uh, let's see, uh, syringe exchanges. A group of volunteers and owners of syringe exchanges realized that individually their programs faced severe underfunding, which is still something that they face today. Um, but together they could advocate for change, create policies and programs that empower people to take it upon themselves to reduce risk immediately. So this is another good point in harm reduction. So for a lot of people, the goal is to be abstinent. The goal is to be in recovery, but harm reduction gives them something that they can do now. It's, you can reduce the harm, potential harm immediately, right? So I could be a drug user and say, you know, I'm, I wanna be clean one day, I wanna be sober, but today I'm still using drugs. What can I do to protect myself today? I could use clean syringes. I could use clean water. I could test my drugs for fentanyl with fentanyl testing strips. Those allow people to um, test their substances to make sure it's not poisoned with fentanyl. And I use the word poisoned because people don't intentionally take fentanyl. It is um, something that people do try to avoid. Like if you're doing a, um, a drug like cocaine, like a powder substance, it's sometimes cut and mixed with other substances that are not meant to be in there. So someone that uses drugs occasionally could get cocaine, for example, and say, hey, I'm worried that this might be fentanyl. What can I do right now to, re to reduce the risk of me overdosing, right? You get a fentanyl test strip, you, uh, of course, look up the directions how to use it, <laughs> but you test it. It's a strip that you dip in the water and you're in the substance, and then you pull it out and it tells you if it's positive or negative. And the point of that is to, when you receive this new information, when you test your drugs and you learn that they are positive for fentanyl, you could say, hey, maybe I don't wanna do this drug. Maybe, maybe I'll do some of it, but less than I normally would, which is reducing the risk of overdose. And that's the goal. You're reducing harm, testing drugs, providing drug users with education, empowers them to make informed decisions on their health and caring about their bodies. That's the first step that they can take to get closer to their recovery, right? Whatever that means for them. Maybe today it's using a clean syringe and testing drugs. Maybe tomorrow it's, hey, mate, I wanna go to detox and I wanna think about treatment. That's how we start these conversations. We ask people to care about their bodies today and we provide them the tools to get there. All right, let's see. <clears throat> the Harm Reduction Work Group was founded in 1993. This was absolutely amazing. This was the first legitimate um, harm reduction organization that was founded in 1993. This was so exciting to learn about. Um, the nation's leading syringe exchange workers came together to educate the community on how to protect themselves from spreading HIV and AIDS. They formed the Harm Reduction Work Group in 1993 and Dan Biggs coined the term harm reduction, meaning any positive change as a person defines it for him or herself. So this is any positive change. This is not saying that I have to be abstinent overnight. Um, you don't have to jump into anything. Anytime you take any good step in the right direction, that's harm reduction. You're reducing the potential harm. And that's where it starts. If you, if you use the harm reduction approach, science has actually found that a person is five times more likely to want to enter recovery than if they were not offered harm reduction tools at all. Because what happens is you take a syringe exchange 
and you ask the drug user to come to you to get these services, right? So when the drug user comes into the syringe exchanges, they are met with medical experts, sometimes even with doctors, nurses, medical staff, and they say, um, hey, here's some information that you might not know that's going on in your area. Here's some local programs. Uh, if you decide to change your mind and enter recovery one day, if you ever want to detox, here's the local detoxes. So when people go to search for these, go in, into these syringe exchange buildings, they are met with resources. And that's how it happens. You plant the seed in their mind. You know, one day they're using drugs, but maybe they're thinking about it now. Maybe they're thinking about recovery and what that may look like. That's planting the seed. And that's, that's what we want. That's the goal. We want to empower people to care about their bodies. And we never know where that might be. So if we are focused on someone being abstinent and making them abstinent, then we're potentially hurting them. We're hurting their growth. We're hurting their empowerment. We're actually kind of smothering them in a way because we're pressuring them to do what we want them to do. If you take the harm reduction approach and offer them resources and have positive conversations and talk to them with love and compassion and empathy, they might make these decisions on their own. That's, <clears throat> that is meeting them where they're at, genuinely and truly and caring about them. So what does it look like today? What does harm reduction look like today? There are approximately 185 needle exchange programs in the United States of America total, which is completely amazing. Um, 18 of them are actually in Ohio. So out of 88 counties, we have 18 syringe exchange programs. Um, and uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of harm reduction going on. And I'm very grateful to be in a, a state that allows syringe exchanges because um, there are some places that it's so stigmatized that syringe exchanges are illegal. And that's the places where disease is spreading out of control and it's the science backs that up. So um, very excited for these, these programs. And so not only do they offer syringes, they offer um, other testing services like um, hepatitis, HIV, AIDS, of course. So you get tested when you go in now and they also offer other educational services like condoms and like I said, referral to treatment and Narcan, which is the overdose reversal drug. And um, now there's Narcan programs today, just like specifically for Narcan. Um, Narcan is the overdose reversal drug that's given away free statewide. Our personal programs in Ohio are Project Dawn and Harm Reduction Ohio. Project Dawn is in, I want to say, 65. There's 65 of them in the state of Ohio. Um, if you do a Google search and say, um, where can I go to Project Dawn to get Narcan? You can look that up and you most likely will have one within a half an hour of you. So like I said, out of 88 counties, there's 65 Project Dawns, which is amazing. That's people that are getting services. That's people that's, that are being served and educated and taken care of. And um, they do their, um, <clears throat> they also do um, syringe exchanges in Cleveland. They have a mobile syringe exchange where you can receive services there also. Um, let's see. Um, almost all states have some type of harm reduction organization. You can find also by doing a Google search. I, I know I'm connected to like almost every state for harm reduction. And if you think about where harm reduction started in 1993, where there was just um, like Los Angeles in New York, that's a huge change. You know, there was just like a few main syringe exchanges and then it turned into this. And we will talk more too about um, Project On and Harm Reduction Ohio and how you can get Narcan. 
Okay, let's see. How can um, you and Ashley, I just wanted to pop in and just say, um, just for mindful of time mm -hmm. um, to uh, make sure that we get to the training here shortly for Greg to wrap oh, up. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Uh, how can you personally get involved? Uh, you can carry Narcan, which we will, like Bethany said, have a Narcan training. Um, you keep it on hand, know how to use it. It's so crucial in case of an emergency. It's like carrying an EpiPen, right? Um, if you know if you know you have an allergy to something, you're going to carry an EpiPen. So that's the that's like the same as that. So if I'm a person in recovery, I'm going to carry Narcan. I know how to use it. I'm going to have it with me in case of an emergency. If a loved one is using it, I'm going to have Narcan. If I'm a concerned citizen, I'm going to have Narcan. Narcan is for everybody. If you have a family member that is using drugs or in recovery, and I say this very seriously, if you're in recovery, you should also have Narcan in your house. People have been relapsing and overdosing, and since the coronavirus, it's gotten worse. So I'm going to advocate for everybody to carry Narcan, even if they think they're in, you know, in recovery. If you're in long-term recovery, please, that's, I can't stress that enough. Um, I've known too many people that were in recovery, overdose, and die, you know, and uh, addiction shouldn't be a death sentence. So I definitely advocate for everyone to have Narcan. Um, the second thing you can do to get involved is uh, learn about your local harm reduction programs, which, like I said, is Harm Reduction Ohio and Project Dawn. Stay up to date on the new information released by them. Uh, most of them have social media to educate and inform people. Some hold events where you can get involved personally and volunteer at them. Uh, Harm Reduction Ohio has a website. Project Dawn has a website, like I said, and they are both on the Ohio Department of Health website. So you can find the one that's closest to you. The third thing you can do to get involved is to help educate and donate. So to better serve the people around you that may be suffering, research as much as you can, stay up to date on new information being released, and be well informed. You can also make a financial contribution to your local harm reduction agency that will use those funds to continue educating and for prevention. Um, also, I have a link down here that's called naloxbox.org. That is a company that comes in and they install a naloxin box in your business. Um, I wish I had a picture of it, but it looks like, um, you know, like where you keep your fire hydrant and AED machine, like if someone's uh, like a first aid kit, they would install it above your first aid kit. It's a clear box that hangs on your wall and they have a box of Narcan in there. So they come in, they train everybody to know how to use it, locate it where it's at in case of an emergency. That's a great resource if you have a business, any kind of building and you have people in it please look into that. And um, if you want, I can type that into the chat box at the end. And here is the nasal Narcan training. There's two different types of Narcan. The other one is intramuscular, but I thought I would go with nasal Narcan because it's more common and user-friendly. It's easier to use. So I'll get ahead and start that now. You know someone who takes prescription opioids like Percocet or Oxycontin or illegal opioids like heroin then you should know about the risk of an accidental, life-threatening opioid overdose. In fact, over 56% of overdoses happen in private homes beyond the immediate reach of doctors and nurses. There's a way for you to help someone who is experiencing an opioid overdose, even if you don't have specialized medical training. In this video are instructions for use, as well as the uses and safety information you should know for using Narcan. But first, it's important to be able to recognize the signs of an overdose. Signs of an opioid overdose include not waking up or responding to your voice or touch, breathing that is very slow, irregular, or has even stopped. The dark center part of the eyes becomes very small, sometimes called pinpoint pupils. Fingernails and lips turn blue or purple. A slow heartbeat, weak pulse, or low blood pressure. If someone has these signs, here's how you can help. Narcan nasal spray is a medicine that reverses the effects of an opioid overdose. Narcan nasal spray is not a substitute for emergency medical care. Repeated doses may be necessary. As with any drug, you need to be aware of important safety information about its use. Please pay particular attention to the indications and important safety information at the end of this video. Also, please see the accompanying full prescribing information in the use of this product. 
Narcan nasal spray was designed for use wherever an emergency opioid overdose happens. Because it doesn't require specialized medical training, it can be given to someone by following these instructions. First, lay the person on their back. Then, remove the device from the box and peel back the package. Hold the device with your thumb on the bottom of the plunger and two fingers on either side of the nozzle. Tilt the person's head back and provide support under their neck with your hand. Place and hold the tip of the nozzle in one nostril until your fingers touch the bottom of their nose. Press the plunger firmly to give the dose into the person's nose. After giving the dose, remove the device from the person's nostril and move them on their side, positioning their hands under their head. Call 911 and get emergency medical help right away after giving the first dose of Narcan nasal spray, even if the person wakes up. Narcan is not a substitute for emergency medical care. Keep the person under observation. If the person doesn't respond by waking up to voice or touch or breathing normally after two to three minutes, administer the second dose provided in the box in the alternate nostril. If they respond and the signs of an opioid emergency have returned after Narcan nasal spray is given, then give another dose in the alternate nostril using a new device and watch them closely until emergency help is received. Additional doses may be given every two to three minutes until they respond or emergency medical help is received. After using Narcan nasal spray, put the device in its box and then dispose in a place safe from children. Narcan nasal spray delivers a consistent, concentrated 4 milligram dose of naloxone that can reverse the effects of a life-threatening opioid overdose in minutes. Visit Narcan.com to learn more. There's a way for you to help someone who is experiencing an opioid overdose, even if you don't have specialized medical training. Indications and important safety information. Thank you. What is Narcan nasal spray? Narcan nasal spray is a prescription medicine used for the treatment of an opioid emergency, such as an overdose or a possible opioid overdose with signs of breathing problems and severe sleepiness or not being able to respond. Narcan nasal spray is to be given right away and does not take the place of emergency medical care. Get emergency medical help right away after giving the first dose of Narcan nasal spray, even if the person wakes up. Narcan nasal spray. <clears throat> okay, I just wanted to um, show you guys that really, really crucial bit of information about how to use Narcan. And of course, if you want the link, I can send you the link. Um, I just wanted to talk about Blythe Barno. She is harm reductions or Ohio's harm reduction minister. Excuse me. <laughs> um, she's a member of the United Church of Christ in Columbus. Um, she got started the same way in harm reduction that I did. She had lost a loved one. And uh, today she's extremely active in the community. She fights for Good Samaritan laws, which is if you uh, are with someone and they overdose, that means if you call for help, you cannot be arrested for that. But there are stipulations to it. Like if you have drugs on you, you may be arrested. So that's what she fights for because people are still dying because the Good Samaritan law does not protect everybody. Um, uh, she currently travels the whole country and holds services, giving speeches, giving trainings in churches. She's absolutely an amazing woman. I put the links to her um, two websites. One is her personal website and the other one is for her church, which is faithinpubliclife.org. Um, she'll be in international, she'll be at International Overdose Awareness Day uh, this year in Newark. It's on the 31st. And I can send you more information on her. Um, her she has webinars also, so um, I can send you more information about her if you would like to. Uh, this is another good faith-based faith -based webinar. If you want to write it down really quick, you can. <clears throat> but they are every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at noon. This is put on by the founding group of people that founded harm reduction in 1993. The harm reduction work group became uh, the harm reduction coalition now. So now they're um, partnering with faith-based community to advocate as that for for that being a pathway to recovery. This yeah, we'll super, send. Yeah, yeah, we'll send this information with the follow up, and you'll have a follow up of the um, uh, with all the presentation materials for everyone too. Yes. So you guys aren't missing out on anything. <laughs> you can have access to all this stuff. Um, I'll touch on this briefly. 
but this is talking about language and how we talk about people who use drugs and how we talk to them. Um, language is an incredibly important tool that can either hurt people or empower people, right? So I advocate for first person language, for person first or people first language, right? So person first language um, maintains the integrity of individuals as whole human beings by removing language that equates them to their condition or negative connotations, right? So if uh, if you're at a doctor, if doctor's visit and he calls you a, um, a drug addict or a junkie, those are slurs, right? We don't, we don't use those words in a clinical setting. You wouldn't expect someone to use a slur. Um, so that's kind of like on my list of don't say, do not say these words because it comes with a lot of stigma attached to it, right? Uh, stigma can be defined as a label with an associated stereotype that elicit, elicits a negative response. Typical stigma related to addiction patients, they are dangerous, unpredictable, and capable of managing treatment at fault for their conditions. Um, and if you have been a drug user or if you have been around a drug user, this is, this is extremely common, right? Stereotypes. Assuming people, you know, they're all the same across the board and they're incapable of managing themselves or if they're incapable of recovery, right? Using person first language gives people their power back, right? You wouldn't say, um, for an example, if you're a cancer patient, you wouldn't say, I'm cancer, this person is cancer. No, you say, I am a person that has cancer. So for me, as a person in recovery, I say, um, I'm a person in recovery. I was formerly a drug user. I don't use um, words that identify myself as my condition or my mental health illness. I say I'm a person in recovery. If someone is using drugs, you say this, per this is person is a drug user. That gives them their power back and restores dignity, right? And that is pretty much the, these other two points that I have here. Um, how can we change it? Be mindful of your language, especially in a clinical setting. Be mindful of your choice of words when discussing a person's mental health. Use per person first language. <clears throat> and uh, you can check the say this, not that for tools, which I can link you also, um, especially like I said, in a clinical setting. So if you are a business, you know, and you treat patients, be careful of the words that you use because they can affect someone's mental health and either be a part of their healing process or a part of re-traumatizing them, right? So we want to steer towards empowerment. So we're not going to use slurs. This is um, my contact information. I'm on Facebook. And I um, also am on Thrive Peer Supports Facebook page. You can follow either one for more harm reduction updates and information. There's my email if you want to contact me directly. Um, I distribute Narcan for Harm Reduction Ohio, or you can contact them directly. This is harmreductionohio.org's website and Project Dawn. Um, they both give Narcan away for free. Harm Reduction Ohio does it through the mail. Project Dawn does it in person. So if you go to this website, log on to their website and uh, type your address in, they'll send it straight to you and you'll, you'll have it within you know a week's time. Yeah, Harm Reduction Ohio is an awesome resource and we'll send all this, all the links to how to access the Narcan, um, as well as on relink.org, we have a list of all the local Project Dawn sites that you can go to. So Ashley, I just wanna thank you so much and give an opportunity for additional questions. Um, and yeah, just thank you. I love your passion for this and your personal, you know, being willing to share your personal experience and everything I think is awesome. So if anybody has questions, please send them either in the chat or the Q&A, whichever you feel most comfortable with. We have a couple good questions here. Um, the first one is, it appears that harm reduction is geared primarily for opiate users and understandably, um, what harm reduction techniques can be used um, for individuals who are using marijuana? 
um, and it's causing them to um, fail drug tests uh, for jobs and a sustained relationships, et cetera. Are there any harm reduction techniques for marijuana that you know of? This is, this is one that peop I get a lot of questions about. People really seem to struggle with it because marijuana is seeming to be turning into, I mean, right, rightfully so, it's based on the individual, right? But it's becoming more of a, a medication, not an illegal drug. So this is where we walk a really fine line, right? Just because something is beginning to be legalized, like if you think about prescription painkillers, just because they're legal and prescribed by a doctor doesn't mean that they are not susceptible, su susceptible to abuse. <laughs> um, I'm so sorry. Um, we gotta look at that the same way that we look at prescription opioids. They are all eligible for abuse. And I know that that itself is not very um, easy to understand for some people, but it's like, Everything can be abused if it's a substance. It all so has what, potential. Be, yeah. mindful, be mindful of the intake. And I would say if you can figure out times, like some people when they drink, they say, I'm only going to drink on the weekends. You can go to meetings. There's actually meetings for that. If you want, I can send you, I can personally send you links for um, different smart recovery meetings. But I, that's something you just have to be mindful for, just like with opiates. You have to be mindful just because you get it prescribed by a doctor doesn't mean it's not going to be abused. That's a really hard one. Thank you, Ashley. So um, for the sake of time, we have a lot of great questions, but we will loop back around to the questions for Ashley towards the end. Um, I'm going to transition things over to Greg to talk a lot more about stigma and the impacts that can have and uh, the role of the faith community. So thank you so much, Ashley. If you could make Greg the host and we'll switch it over to him. Awesome. And um, yeah, he should be able to share his screen now. Here we go. Well, it's good to be with you. It's good to have a chance to share with you. Um, hopefully you're hearing okay. Uh, I do want to just quickly go through this. Um, you'll get a copy of this presentation and this deck, so you'll have a chance to kind of go back and refer. But uh, really the, the, the role of the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes is really just to kind of take this uh, concept of stigma, kind of define it for what it is, uh, talk about the harm that it does do, um, and then give some practical ways that folks of faith uh, can begin to respond to this community in a different way and respond with different languages, as Ashley mentioned, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So when I look at stigma, you know, just from a definition perspective, it's a mark of disgrace or infamy. And in the case of substance use disorder, it often stems from the behavior that happens when someone is in the throes of their use. Um, so we, you know, we, we've all seen the person that's had too much to drink. We've seen the person, you know, we, we hear all the time about folks that overdose. And so that, what happens tends to characterize what they are. And that's where this blending of, you know, or taking away the personal piece of it and making you part of the disease really kind of, really kind of originates. Um, so what I wanted to try to do in my screen is really freezing up. I don't know what's going on here. I apologize very much. Um, let's try a different way, not having a chance to go down, there we go. So hopefully it'll start moving a little quicker. Um, back in 2019, uh, really on uh, Governor DeWine's very first day in office, right after he was uh, sworn in, uh, he created something called Recovery Ohio. And you'll see a picture of the folks there on the screen. Uh, it's a very diverse group of people, law enforcement, um, judges, uh, physicians, uh, I'm on that particular group as well, uh, kind of representing the faith community. We have folks that run peer centers, um, all kinds of people on there. We spent about 90 hours at the beginning of 2019 to develop the reports that you see there. 
And when we all got done with a lot of experience in the room, some folks with, you know, 30 plus years of, uh, of recovery and, and years of being in the, in the space of treating folks dealing with substance use. Um, when we got finished, our number one issue that we knew we needed to address as Recovery Ohio was stigma. And if you look at the report, you'll see that. And so what I want to say is why is addiction stigmatized? And often it, it, it comes with shame, uh, the consequences of, of what happens when we you know, are, are engaged in substance use disorder, when, we, when we're suffering from it. Often you know, we have lots and lots of consequences and with those consequences come a lot of shame. Uh, societally, we have uh, categorized folks that are in this, uh, in this challenge uh, with some pretty harsh words. Ashley mentioned some of them, you know, you know junkie, addict, loser, failure. Um, so when, when we have those kinds of stigmatizing language that's attached to someone who's suffering from substance use disorder, it continues to perpetuate it. Um, there is this view that uh, substance use disorder is a, is a choice. Uh, there are choices involved with it, but it's also an illness. And I think when we can begin to swing that toward the illness part, it helps to reduce the stigma. Uh, historically, folks who suffered with this, they kept it very private. Uh, it wasn't for public consumption. We didn't talk about it. And early on, you know, for 80 years, uh, recovery was kind of relegated to the basement. Uh, you, you were in the shadows. You went down to the meeting that was at the church when no one was there. And so we, we hit it. My personal experience when it comes to the faith community and, and the stigmatization is I grew up in the church. Um, when I started to suffer from alcoholism and benzodiazepine abuse, uh, the last place that I wanted to go to was my church. And the scariest place I went back to after I found recovery was my church. And it's because my church really didn't understand me. They, I felt, maybe they weren't doing it, but I felt intensely judged there. And so, you know, from a personal side of it, you know, even, even when we're not meaning to, there's just some connotation that comes along with I'm already, I already carry some shame for where I'm at. And then it just seems to perpetuate it more in the faith community sometimes, at least from my standpoint, um, you know, it was just tough to go back there. So what else does stigma do? It really advances our suffering. And if we take a look, it doesn't matter what your, you know, uh, guide is, whether you're the Bible, the Quran, the Torah, other, other, you know, guidance for spirituality, all of them, you know, really kind of single in on these, of uh, being kind. Uh, in, in Psalm 34, it's actually the, that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, that we have kindness in there. And so if we're really wanting to, to start to reduce this stigma, we need to understand the suffering that it causes and also embrace what we know to be good behavior. And that is being kind and seeking for ways to serve the brokenhearted. And so just some things that are here, and I won't go through all of them. Probably the most important couple of them is that due to stigma, often only one in 10 folks actually seek treatment. And it's because they, they just, A, it's hard to find where to go. It's difficult to find the resource. That's why Relink is here. But on the other side of it, it's, I don't want to admit that I've got this issue. And if I go to treatment, then everybody's going to know. I have a dear friend that I used to work with, a colleague back in, in my days of, of uh, alcohol abuse, and he had reached out for help. And, you know, we had to get over a big hump of, look, it's okay if somebody knows that you're seeking some help because you, you got an illness and we want to go take care of that. A couple other ones that, that you can see there, clearly health insurance sometimes, it doesn't cover it adequately, so I, I can't get all the help that I need. But there's really this belief of hopelessness that happens in this community and, and that I really can't get out, that, that I'm in this hole. I've dug it for myself. I've got all the shame that goes with it. My family's, you know, not, not engaged with me anymore. I, I can't get out. And with that hopelessness, and, and if we're going to be beacons of hope within the church, then we can turn the narrative around. We can, we can make this a different conversation. And so one of the things that we need to do as faith leaders or just as leaders in our community is, is recognize that we have to change the narrative about what substance use disorder is. Uh, it, addiction is a treatable chronic medical disease. Uh, it, it has genetic components, environmental components, experience components. And when we can look at it that way, rather than the moral failing that it's been kind of put into that category for a long time, then we can begin to say, okay, if I look at it that way, then it does, it does point me toward, oh, well, we can treat that. 
that's an illness. We, we treat other things. We, we treat diabetes. We treat heart disease. Why can't we go ahead and treat substance use disorder? And one of the things that came out of, of Hazelden, a report in, in 20, 2019, their huge uh, recovery center up in the Minnesota area and, and other places, is that addiction is one of our nation's biggest public health problems. When we look at it as a public health problem, then we want to engage it in that fashion. And so there's a great uh, link there that you'll get when you get the deck to go and talk about addiction as a disease. It's very, it, it's just very thorough and it's simple and it really does help frame addiction in a different way as what it is, an illness and a public health issue. And so Recovery Ohio came to the conclusion that stigma and misinformation, you know, it, it actually perpetuated and, and actually moved consequences to a greater degree because folks wouldn't seek help. And, and some of those who were providing help weren't educated enough about what substance use disorder is and what it isn't. And so they didn't have the correct information to help well. And so that's why we made it the number one thing in our report to try to address in the state of Ohio. And so when we look at uh, this perspective from Betty Ford, it's a, it's a long hidden reality that people actually do recover. Ashley is a great example of that. I'm a great example of that. And, and the interesting part is that when we recover, we're every bit as productive and intelligent and talented and, and, and clearly flawed as anybody else is, you know, but we're, we're in recovery. We have value. We're making progress, just like we're all making progress. And interestingly enough, we, we take a look at the, the, the crisis in our, in our country and we say, oh my gosh, we, we have 20 million people who are, who are, you know, say that they have a substance use disorder, they're suffering from addiction. But the reality is we have 23 and a half million or more that are in recovery. We don't talk about that as often. And that, that continues to perpetuate that stigma. So many of the negative stigmatizing behavior symptoms associated with the disease of addiction, they actually get better when the person gets better. They, they're better with their kids. They, they can hold a job. They uh, can become leaders in their church. Um, and so when we start to move away from this idea and continue to categorize them and, and label them as their illness, then we can begin to see the potential that's in somebody and it does get better. I love what the partnership in, in Washington, D.C., the, the center there says, it's that prejudice and shame will be replaced by a spirit of compassion. It's going to open the doors and hearts and resources to those suffering from substance use disorder. When we can remove the stigmatization, when we can pull the shame away from the consequence, when we can begin to say that treatment and resources are available and you are encouraged to go, don't be ashamed to go, then we can really begin to see this tide turn. And we're seeing this. We're seeing it. Ashley's seeing it every day. She's out there. She's seeing it. People do recover. And so one of the things that I wanted to look at from my lens, and I, and I come from an evangelical Christian perspective, but, you know, when we look to respond, we're really called to respond. I mean, in, in, my, in my construct, the Lord tells me that I'm to encourage the downcast. I'm to help the sick. This is an illness. I'm to help the sick. But also I'm to be patient with all of them. This is a process for most people. Have I seen people delivered from this? Absolutely. But it's a process for most. And so I have to learn patience. And how do I get that patience? I get it by understanding what this is and what it isn't. It's through education. And so a couple of weeks back, we, we went through the science of addiction for faith leaders. You can get that from Bethany and the team, uh, a copy of that, uh, that presentation, as well as I, I think the video that went with it. But when I educate myself about how to help without hurting, uh, Ashley mentioned trauma understanding the trauma that people are suffering from that likely is the reason for their substance use. I call it the why behind their whatever. So as a faith leader, how am I to respond in order to reduce stigma? It comes through education. And it comes through education on how I can learn what this is, what it isn't, how I can respond well, how I can serve well, and how I can help well. Ashley mentioned that language of addiction, language is important. Everything we say matters and how we say it matters. And so I'll, I'll skip past this, but this will be in your deck. These are just some additional, you know, ways to look at how do I change the way that I speak about substance use? How do I change the way I speak about those who are challenged by it? And so that'll be there. So I want to kind of close with this because we're getting tight on our time today. And 
One of the things that I go back to, again, from my lens evangelically, is that when we are looking at this challenge from the church's perspective, how do we help as the church? I go to John 8. In John 8, um, a woman who was caught in adultery was brought to Jesus. She was brought by a bunch of the faith folk. And uh, they threw her down on the ground, and they were wanting to see what Jesus was going to do with her. What was he going to do? The law said that she had to be stoned to death. Didn't say anything about the guy she was with, by the way. But the law said she needed to be stoned to death. And those religious leaders, that's what they were expecting. But instead, Jesus stooped down, met her where she was. And then what did he do? He began to call out those that were around and say, hey, if you don't have any sin... Go ahead and fire that first stone. In my space, my wife calls it this. She calls, everybody's got stuff. And some, some people's stuff makes the headlines of the paper. Some people's stuff is, is, is uh, you know, a little different than others, but we all got stuff. And so I need to, to kind of end with this idea that as, faith, as the faith community, what are we going to be? Are we going to be stupers and come alongside and meet people where they are and understand what they're dealing with? Jesus understood what she was dealing with. Or are we going to be those that have a stone in our hand and waiting to throw it? And I think if we can lean toward the idea of being a stupor versus a stone thrower, I think we will start to be a more trusted avenue for folks who are dealing with this challenge to come to find the help and a trusted avenue and a place for them to continue to be helped because we will be the place that isn't stigmatizing, that is coming alongside, that is meeting them where they are, it is stooping to serve them rather than judging them. So I leave it with this at this last kind of statement. The illness of addiction is nothing to be ashamed of, but stigmatizing it is. And so let's not be a part of the stigma. Let's not be the perpetuators of that as faith leaders. Let's go back and take a look at what the Lord's called us to do or what your particular faith tradition has called you to do. And that's be kind. And I can be kind and I can serve well if I know how to serve well. And how, when I don't serve well, when I use that language, how damaging it can be, even leaving people in their suffering. So I'll close with that. I'll give it back to you, Bethany, hopefully. Right. And Thank uh, you so much, Greg. Sure. Yeah, so we will um, address, I think we, we've got one great question that I want to address. Um, and then we will do the final follow-up announcements, and then we'll answer some more questions after that. So please, if you have questions, send them in the Q&A and chat um, if you're available to stay on a little bit longer. So the first question that I just want to address quickly while we still have a couple minutes um, was, are the physical signs for Ashley, um, this is the question, are the physical signs the same for African Americans um, for overdose, like skin turning purple? Yes, you will see their skin tone become ashy, pale, and um, their fingertips will also be turning like a bluish or purple color. But yes, you will definitely notice on darker skin tones the difference between their normal skin and when they're overdosing. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to put up the, the final slide and then of course keep sending in your questions and um, we will address them and then any ones that we cannot address in the presentation, we will address at the end um, or afterwards in the follow-up. So just one moment to share. I just want to take a quick minute to thank both Ashley and Greg for yeah. sharing this wonderful information with us. I mean, it, it was it was really good. I think it's just a great reminder um, and, 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 and information for the faith community on, on, on being the hands and feet of Christ and to just be be there to be. I love that analogy, Greg, of being being a stupor. And um, you know, and I humbly admit I've had to learn some things along this journey for my professional career, you know, um, and, and just learning how to address it and to, and to really never, ever forget, as both of y'all stated so well, that it is a human being that's dealing with, with trauma and this is a symptom um, of it. And we need to always remember that and, and view it as such. So thank you guys very much for doing a, a really great job for all of us. Yes, thank you. 
Um, so just some final takeaways. We will be sending out a recording of this um, and all the links and materials that you need. I um, try to look through all the chat and everything to make sure that you all receive the follow-up information. Um, it, just a couple next steps. There will be a post-webinar survey that pops up as soon as you all close out and leave the meeting. Um, please take a few moments to take that. It is super helpful with us, um, not only for our tracking, for the funding we receive to conduct these webinars, but also so that we can continue to make them better as we move forward in the series and beyond. Um, another great thing that I would love for you all to participate in is the new Facebook group that we've started, Ohio's Faith and Recovery. We are hoping that the discussions that we're having today um, and the topics that we're covering, it doesn't have to end with this presentation. We want to continue those conversations in this Facebook group, share uh, strategies and ideas, questions, things like that as we go forward and um, after the webinar series is over. So please, please join the Facebook group. That information will be in the follow-up email, which will be coming out um, tomorrow or Friday. And then lastly, register for the rest of the series that you can do by going to relink.org slash news and sliding and scrolling down to the announcement about the webinars. So please join us for the next one, which will be on the 27th. And if you have any other questions for like logistics or things like that, you can always send them to me at bfriedrichson at relink.org. And so I will go back to questions and um, we will answer a few more of those before we wrap this up. So let me pull those up. I think that another great one, which Greg, you may um, have some thoughts on this as well based on, I know you were recently on a call about this, but let me go to it just to make sure. The intersectionality between um, harm reduction and um, things like racial disparity and things like that. So strategies that may be being utilized to address um, the trauma and as it relates to harm reduction for individuals of color. So if if that was a topic of that recent uh, call you were on, that'd be great to hear from you. If, if not, I can have Ashley also touch on this. Well, no, and it actually probably be a little bit better. The call that I sat in on was a, a national call and it was really to address this specifically, um, the, the role of harm reduction and, and how it kind of fits into some of these social determinants of health, some of the disparities, you know, for other racial groups when it comes to any sort of intervention or any sort of education and engagement. And I think harm reduction, um, kind of because of, of folks uh, seeking those services, it highlights some of the other disparity that exists. Um, you know, though, you know, someone coming in, for example, to, to a syringe exchange, uh, may you know also really be in need of, of food service. They really may be in need of, of other you know clinical um, interventions, and and so by coming there, it, it highlights that they're being underserved. And then how do we go about how do we go about you know kind of solving those issues? And one of the great challenges is is that bringing up champions within those cultural groups that can be the voice for those neighborhoods, the voice for um, the change there, and also the voice to, to help educate is critical. And sometimes that's hard because there's a certain reluctance of trust. You know, for example, if I wander into the African-American community and talk about, you know, harm reduction, I don't have the right voice for that. But someone who's a champion who has been through the education that Ashley can provide or Blythe can provide or others and be able to go in and be the voice that is the voice they'll hear, then we can really make uh, a quite a bit of difference there. I don't know if you have anything to add, Ashley, or not. Yeah, Ashley, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, as for intersectionality, it is a very, it's a very deep conversation, and it's very difficult to have, and that could be its own separate webinar. Um, what I do know about 
intersectionality in the harm reduction community is that people of color are dramatically less likely to receive quality care. They're more likely to fall through the cracks when going through treatment or seeking services. Um, this has been, um, more light has been shed on this topic. There's a lot of more, there's a lot more webinars going on, like different organizations, like harm reduction organizations are specifically talking about this because uh, people of color, um, like indigenous people also face this, face the same thing that um, uh, black people are facing and not even just that, but the women, it's, um, I wish I could remember the statistic, I don't want to say, but it's, they're just, they're dramatically less likely to receive the same quality care that white people are. And it's really disheartening to hear that, but it's, it's a reality that people are facing. And um, I do have a few good links to some information on intersectionality, if people are interested in them, um, because it's a topic that we definitely need to start having more often in figuring out the root causes of this and why are people of color falling through the cracks? You know, why are they have, being treated differently in a clinical setting than, you know, white drug users are? Um, I wish I could speak more to that, but I am not that as ed as educated as I would like to be. So mm -hmm. I no, do I think, you know. yeah, I think that's great. I think you guys both spoke, um, you know, based on what you have learned uh, some resources for people and we'll definitely send those out. Um, let me see. There's another question about thinking about a harm reduction mindset. How, and, and you know, I, I don't think maybe any of us are particularly specialized in this, but how do you address the uptick in petty crime in neighborhoods where drug usage is high? So I think they're looking at it as that's a, a harm that happens due to drug use uh, behaviors sometimes. And I, I mean, I think that there's people in different roles yeah. that address that, but if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, of course. So um, poverty, this is a part of intersectionality, right? People that are being oppressed by multiple um, parts of society. This is not just drug use, that's the symptom of the poverty. It's a symptom of people um, living in low income neighborhoods, they're poor, there's no resources, there's lack of access to care, um, especially um, in neighborhoods that like I was saying before, more heavy on people of color. And if you combine that with poverty and you combine that with drug use and you combine that with crime, it can all look like the drugs are the cause, but it's not, that's a symptom of poverty. Mm -hmm. And there are statistics to back that up. If people are interested in learning more about that, I would love to talk, I would love to talk more about it. Yeah, that's, that's, great. A, that's a very in-depth conversation also. And this mm -hmm. has been proven. So like when you put resources into a low income neighborhood where there is a lot of crime, you'll see that slowly change and morph. Like if you put a syringe exchange in a neighborhood where there's high drug use, you'll notice the neighborhood will be cleaned up because they'll have areas where they can dispose of syringes. They'll have areas to go where they can access care and treatment. It's a pattern. It's a, it's a mm -hmm. pattern that's been repeated for a long time. Yeah, yeah definitely. definitely. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, you. And then we'll do one more question. Um, this is a little bit, uh, you know, off the track of harm reduction, but the question is, what are some resources for helping those addicted to crack cocaine? There isn't much uh, attention given to crack addiction. The solution given is usually prison. Um, I don't know if Greg, you have any thoughts on that? Well, um, you know, coming at it from my treatment provider lens, um, you know, I know from the provider's perspective, I, I don't think that there's, you know, any, I, I guess, intentional uh, singling out of one particular substance versus another. I mean, we, you know, we, we have all uh, different, uh, you know, drugs of choice that, that come in seeking treatment in, in, in the house that I'm a part of. And so 
I, I don't know, you know, maybe where that's, that's rooted in. I, I know that the opioid issue gets so much attention. In fact, mm -hmm. we were having this conversation yesterday with our recovery community organizations. And because most of the funding currently is tied to it, that, you know, it, it does seem like some of our other, you know, challenges are kind of put to the, to the wayside. There, there, there's actually, you know, some challenge right now with folks who are looking for help when it comes to alcoholism. Um, some of the things have changed in terms of reimbursement with that. So, so I get where that question is coming from. I don't think it's a provider issue. I think it's more kind of a, a you know, just the thought of we, we had to go attack this thing that really was this huge gorilla and as a result, some of these other things got, you know, pushed aside. But I, I don't think that the opportunity to get help in that frame has changed much. It just doesn't get the attention that it might have gotten before. Mm -hmm. Ashley, any thoughts on resources yes. for crack cocaine? Yes. So I look at crack cocaine as the same as um, any other drug when you're using equipment. So um, if you think about how you would use crack cocaine, you need... Um, a crack pipe and you need the utensils to use it, make sure that those are clean. That's harm reduction for uh, crack specifically. And um, there's meetings for crack cocaine addiction. I treat all these drugs the same in the sense of like how we deal with them from a harm reduction perspective. And if you need more specific advice, there's actually 12 step programs for crack cocaine. Um, also, crack cocaine, I don't want to say, I, I mean, I do know that it's been cut with other drugs as well, so I know that there's a need in the community for education in that aspect, but that's more of like powdered cocaine. Um, really, I would just say use clean supplies, and there are 12-step resources for crack cocaine specifically. Yeah, so the resources are available. Okay, well, thank you both so much. Um, so I think that covers most of the questions. I'll take a look back at the chat afterwards and make sure that we covered everything. I know that um, Ashley has a couple other resources she's already sent me that I can send out for some of the other questions and additional information. But thank you all so much. We hope that you will be joining us on the 27th and uh, check us out on Facebook, join the Facebook group. I'm gonna say it again. Um, and I will be following up with you all here shortly. So have a wonderful rest of your day. And I hope that this was something that you can use even just today to be thinking about the stigma and things like that in your day-to-day -day life. So thank you both to our presenters and we'll see you next time.